Welcome back to another episode of the Mac Rumor Show. Hartley, you're not where I can't. T- I can't. You're not with me anymore. It's very sad. No, sadly not. Yeah. Although in the future, wink, wink, there's going to be some episodes where we are once again together. And by the way, uh, no, we didn't plan <laughs> to all wear white shirts. Um, <laughs> In a white room with silver, you know, and white-ish products. That was not, none of that was planned. We literally, for those of you who are um, interested, we all had like a giant house together in which, you know, a lot of the Macrimers team was together. And I just came downstairs like, all right, man, you ready to record these uh, <laughs> these podcast episodes? Didn't notice at all that we were wearing the same like c- kind of shirt. It was just a plain white shirt. Like did, had no idea until after we filmed it. I don't. I, I don't think I noticed until after people started commenting on it. Honestly, so. Well, we. Well, needless to say, we got the message. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we were wearing the same color shirt. So, needless to say, you're going to probably be seeing some very similar. You know, just pull the shades back. We we recorded a couple of episodes at a time. Um, some really cool episodes. We have the founder of Mac Rumors, Arnold Kim. He's going to be talking all about Mac Rumors and like the history and some super interesting stuff that honestly. I've been at the company for like five or six years now, and I had no idea about Hartley. You, you know, you learned some great things. Even Arnold learned some things yeah. that he had no idea about. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to be having some episodes like that. And today, we were planning on doing, you know, our basic format with the news, and then jumping into our main topic, which is all about Apple Car. And um, we already filmed that segment with our guest, Ben Sullins, and we realized that we had an insane amount of content there to where I think we just don't need to do the daily roundup of news because there's just so much. So with that said, we're going to jump in to uh, our pre-recorded version here with Ben Sullins about the Apple car and kind of the history of EVs. Moving on to our main topic, you might notice that we actually have a guest, Ben Sullins. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. You are our expert on all things electric vehicles, which is our main topic, the Apple car. Um, I never thought we would actually be talking about this in all like seriousness because in my mind, Apple's just not making a car. And that's kind of how it started with the rumors and everything for many years, but now it's become something that actually seems like it's on the trajectory of happening. Um, But before we get into the Apple Car specifics, um, why don't you tell everybody more about your channel and like your history with EVs and, you know, kind of your expertise on them? Yeah, sure. So I stumbled into YouTube, I think like a lot of people where I did something that took off and I started to do more of that. And that Mm -hmm. thing was I bought a Tesla back in 2016 and I looked at how much money I was saving by owning it on fuel. And people really liked that message. I think maybe it gave them more validation about their own purchase or whatever, you know, uh, uh, obsession people already had. I kind of validated that for them. And then so I just kept covering, you know, my owner experience being a Tesla owner back in 2016. And then that grew into lots like a whole YouTube kind of content business. And then eventually other companies started making interesting electric cars. They weren't just Nissan Leafs and things like that. And so then I started covering them and and doing all that. So now, you know, in some circles, I'm an auto journalist where I get invited to anytime there's a new EV coming out and I go review that or whatever. Um, But I've sort of shifted away to where now um, I just wait for them to give me a press loaner and they'll bring one of these new EVs to my house. They let me have it for a week. Um, And then I get to drive it like a real car. I get to daily drive it. And, you know, I'm not the first to post about it. But I think my posts and my reviews are much more authentic and real than just, hey, they flew me to some exotic destination for three days and I sat in it for 30 minutes. It's like, no, I lived with this. I've got two kids, a wife. I live in in Southern California. So I get to use it like a more common use case than just, hey, I'm a car guru, right? So it's kind of a different perspective. Well, yeah. Um, But yeah. Especially with like events like that where you're kind of being pampered and like you're in a nice totally yeah I mean it's it's definitely gives you you know we're human so it gives you a different perspective on the product or in your case the car that you're out there to see um, and so it's nice that you get them at home where you're not being pampered you've got your kids right. you've got to you've got to do the pain that I know all too well of taking out the car seats putting the car <laughs> seats in the new car trying not to go insane during that time frame and so that was kind of one of the main reasons why um, we were excited to have you on is because like 
we wanted to talk more about the state of EVs and then kind of drop in some of the news that we've heard about Apple and see like what is it going to take for Apple to like make an actual successful vehicle. Um, and so with that said, what are you currently driving right now? Are you still in Teslas or have you moved on to something else? Yeah, I, I sold my, my Model S uh, just over a year ago and I got a Rivian R1T. So I have a truck now. Okay. And it's perfect for where I live, for my situation with the family. It's a smaller truck, but it's super fun. Um, I will say it's not as good as the Ford Lightning, the electric F-150, in terms of its truckness. But mm -hmm. it is so much more fun. And where I live, parking spaces are tight, roads are small. So it's really great. So that's what I have. And then my wife drives a Tesla Model Y. And we've owned, at this point, every Tesla they make, uh, with the exception of the original Roadster. So lots of experience as an owner of there and of those. And then I've driven probably any EV you can name out there, with the exception of maybe some of the latest ones. So with regards to... Apple car, um, if indeed it is going to be called that. We've seen quite a lot of these rumors developing over the years, and it really seems like Apple's ambitions have changed as time has gone on, um, where initially they were looking at something that was perhaps uh, without a steering wheel, without pedals, um, without conventional seats, and more like a limousine configuration inside the car. And it looks like now they have sort of repositioned the vehicle to be a little bit less ambitious, and now we are expecting it to be effectively just set up like a normal vehicle, at least with a driver's seat, a steering wheel, um, and pedals. So in terms of design um, and what we could expect this interior to look like, where do you think Apple needs to take this vehicle in order to separate itself from the competition as it stands, but also stay realistic within what is going to be possible within the next five years or so? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a smart move for them to sort of scale back those ambitious plans. And you guys would be more in touch with this than I am. But I mean, Apple, as I, you know, and I've been working in tech since 1998. So I've been in the tech industry as like a database engineer and data scientist for many, many years. And Apple, I've never really, I mean, early days it was different, but nowadays I don't see them as major risk takers with the products they develop. And I say that because their products are so mass market that they can't to do things that are so wildly out there that like they would risk it being a failure. So I think it makes a lot of sense for them to scale it back to a design that people won't, like like, like you're saying originally, like oh, more limousine style configuration, no pedals. That would be a huge leap for them and for the consumer. And I think that would be very risky. And at their size and their scale, I don't know, or at least from my experience following them, it doesn't appear that that's something that they have the appetite for. So I think it's smart what they're doing. In terms of how to succeed, uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, the quality is the thing that would separate them from everyone else. Um, if you guys have driven EVs or you know the, the different um, spectrum out there, you have the Teslas of the world who are still innovating like it's 2012 and like if they have to you know they take away the gear stocks they don't even give you a whole steering wheel anymore mm -hmm. they're making these things that are still really boundary pushing when people like me that have been following them for a long time argue they don't need to like they've won right they're yeah. there it's almost like when the iphone came out what it did to the smartphone market you had a lot of people that made fun of it that, oh there's no keyboard oh my god how could anyone blah 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 and now basically every smartphone is either an iPhone or something that is looks identical to it, right? You can argue features to, you know, the cows come home. But the point being, they won and everyone else needs to get on board. And so I think Tesla did that as well in the EV space. And that's what you see with almost all the other traditional automakers is they're trying to play catch up. They're trying to be more Tesla-like. So I think Apple could do a really good job here by looking at what Tesla's done and sort of one-upping them in areas that they are better at. And I would say the number one area that I think they would be better is in quality. Um, one of the things, like I have an iPhone now, this is my, my first iPhone. Um, and the thing I do love about it is that I can rely on it. Whereas a Pixel phone will crash if you open too many apps or dumb things like that, where you're like, I can't have that happen. Now, Tesla has famously all or infamously all over failed in the quality department again and again they make incredible products but there are a lot they have a long ways to go that's why when you see things like 
Mercedes making the EQS or BMW making the i7, like their top tier, top highest end sedans, you know that those are going to be better cars. They may not be as good on the tech side, but the people buying those cars would rather have the quality vehicle versus the super advanced technology. So I think Apple has the opportunity here to kind of kind of eat Tesla's lunch in a way if they do it properly, because clearly they'll have the tech side of it, especially in, in I, I saw some notes. I don't know if I'm assuming basically the next iteration of Apple CarPlay, which is much more um, like like hardwired into the into the car, not just like a an app that runs. Um, yeah. I assume that they would use that or some variant of that, maybe use something you know beyond that, which would make it even better in the technology side of the the the, the car. And then if they can deliver on a quality vehicle, then it's it, it's going to be a serious headwind for Tesla. I would say no one else has really given Tesla a run for their money. In fact, if you look. The recent stats, they still are something like 80% of EVs sold are Teslas. So, like, they own the market, especially here in the U.S. Um, the only one that I've even thought of that could give them a run for their money is Apple. Um, and so quality, I would say, would be the big differentiator for them. So if that's going to be key to the Apple car's identity, one thing I'm really intrigued to get your thoughts on, Ben, is obviously all all car brands sort of have this identity not only in terms of perhaps the things they're known for but also just in the in in terms of the way these cars feel and particularly with EVs we've seen automakers try and layer on certain gimmicks maybe with uh like the BMW i4 and the sort of the 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 sounds that they've engineered for the uh for the vehicle to make and, and this sort of thing and even just in terms of the the handling and the just the, the feel of the car ultimately. So I wonder if you had to speculate on what we could expect an Apple car to actually feel like to drive, where would you expect that to go? Are you just expecting it to mm. be uh, like a Tesla or are we expecting it to be a bit uh, less playful perhaps? I, I don't know. What, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, they would need to have good acceleration because that's all EVs. Um, that, but that, that should be easy to accomplish just because of the physics of how the motors work and everything. Uh, I would hope that the, that the handling would be better than Tesla's. I actually, and I think most car enthusiasts, not if you talk to, you know, uh, Tesla Twitter, it's a different animal, but if you talk to actual car people, they hate how Tesla's drive. They're really poor, but it doesn't matter because they excel in so many other areas that people, the, the majority of people who came from a Honda Civic or Toyota Camry or Ford Focus, to them, it's a magic vehicle, right? But to an actual car person, they're like, oh my God, I can't even ride in this thing. So I would hope that it would be better. But I still think, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but Apple's market is the mass market. So I don't think they would be trying to say compete with a BMW or Mercedes or Porsche or somebody like that who have very distinctive sort of feels about them. I would imagine that it would be hopefully a comfortable ride. Um, and then maybe you have different driving modes, but in terms of suspension, all that, I mean, this is honestly the biggest question for me about Apple making a, a car is how do they, I mean, I guess they have all the money in the world, but still you have to have a factory. That factory has to have a supply chain behind it. And, you know, Apple obviously is tremendous at this with the other products that they make, but this is like a whole new product line. I would, I would argue going from an iPhone to an iPad, the, the supply chain is probably, there's a lot of overlap. Whereas going into a vehicle, it's a totally different ball game. Not that they can't do it, but that to me is the biggest hill to climb here. So how they come up with that brand identity and that feel and all that, I would imagine it would be something that just is mass market targeted, not something that is super niche in terms of ultra luxury or ultra performance or anything like that, because that's, that's really hard to pull off. Um, and then also it may uh, sort of, you know, disenfranchised some people. Some people may not like how it feels. And then that I don't think would be in their marketing plan. If I were, if I were imagining from sitting in that room, you know, what they're thinking. Hartley, the company that they're working with is Hyundai, correct? Not Honda. Well, this is, this is one of the open questions. So yeah, uh, Hyundai has spoken about this. They were, they were the only automaker to actually explicitly say when they were not supposed to say that they were in talks with Apple about some sort of collaboration on this vehicle. But it's it seems like Apple has been in talks with virtually every major automaker because it's, it, it's mm -hmm. not capable of setting up this supply chain. Um, so realistically, right. it will have to rely on some sort of 
major automaker um, as a partner, um, whether that's Hyundai, whether it's Honda, um, there's been talks of working with um, several smaller slightly more niche brands um, just to bring in that expertise. It looks like that's something that's going to happen, but they possibly are not even nailed down to a specific partner yet um, because we're still looking mm. at, we're still years away from this thing. So it's still realistically uh, in, in a design stage at this point. And any discussions that are going on with automakers are going to be whether they are capable of meeting these requirements. Well, isn't the current launch date rumor 2026, which I mean is probably not going to happen. But like usually on this show, whenever we talk about anything in the future, I'm like, that's way too long. That's way too long. But with a car <laughs> and especially with something that we yeah. know, like we know a lot about, but also kind of feel like we know very little about uh, a car in 2026. That's three years, two and a half, maybe um, that doesn't that doesn't seem like that long from now. And so. I'm a little confused. Like they, they need to have that kind of like partner, you know, nailed down uh, pretty fast. And then in my mind is like, okay, so let's just say it is Hyundai or Hyundai, like how Hartley would uh, pronounce it. Um, yeah, it I, don't, I still don't. I still don't know the correct pronunciation. I, I've heard it like six different ways. So, uh, <laughs> so are we looking at more like an Ionic it's a Hyundai five? And a Hyundai. Exactly. So are we looking at more like an Ionic 5, 6? Are they going to like have to rely on stuff that already exists? Well, I guess in that time frame, it'll be whatever their next iterations are of those cars. But like, you know, usually they don't drastically change the body design that far from now. So like, is that what we're looking at? Or is Apple just going to be like, yo, you use your stuff, but you make this design that we have? Um, is that what you guys are thinking is going to happen? Well, yeah, it would have to be a, their own design, right? I mean, but Hyundai is a great partner. The Hyundai Group, who owns Kia um, and Genesis and a handful of other brands you probably haven't heard of, like tremendous partner. If that's who they went with, in fact, I would argue right now their uh, their products in the U.S. Uh, anyways are absolutely crushing it. Right, the Ionic Five just won SUV of the year, which I still argue it's not an SUV. But I was going to say whatever. SUV um, is a very loose <laughs> term there, yeah. but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like a fuzzy definition, but no, yeah. I, I, that would be a great partner, and that makes all all the sense in the world to find someone like that. And I don't know, I mean, I guess Apple's big enough if it would even make sense, but they could like just buy the company probably and force them to do whatever they want, you That's know, true. at their scale. The batteries might be a question, but I was thinking about this more leading up to this, you know, because batteries are hard to come by, but you know, Apple like they sell a gazillion iPhones and they sell tons of things with batteries already. So in terms of supply chain, I imagine it's not too hard to get those. Um, and if they're partnering with, you know, Hyundai or someone else, they can figure it out. But I would have to imagine it have to be their own design and yeah, built by someone else like that. Cause I mean, they don't like own the factories that, buy, that make iPhones, right? Isn't it Foxconn and these other companies and things? Yeah. Yeah. So that makes that makes all the sense in the world to me. The question I really have about this is go to market strategy because you know I remember the days when people would stand in line for the iPhone, uh, you know, in the rain in New York or whatever, and it didn't matter. But now, I mean, Apple's not like Tesla in the fact that like if they say they're going to make something, generally it's going to happen. I know there have been some products where they've sort of teased them or whatever, and then they never came to fruition. But point being, like they're not in the same game where Tesla can, you know, the Cybertruck is a great example, right? Like, hey, put your deposit down. Here it is. It's been, th it's three years late and it's still like, oh, it may come next year. We're not sure, you know, and it depends who you ask. But it's one of those things where it's not very Apple-like the current, say, go-to-market strategy from Tesla and others. So I'm curious how they'll handle that. Like if it's 2026, are they going to say, here's the car, it'll be, you know, on your doorstep in two weeks? Or is it going to be, here's the car, put the order down, and then in two years, we'll have it to you? Because that, I think, would be a much more reasonable time frame. And it's sort of, I think, what people expect now in this new world where companies sell direct to consumer uh, cars and things of that nature. I think it's going to be a very different strategy to anything that Apple has done before, ultimately, because not they, they need this uh, this whole new infrastructure. They're not going to be able to put these things uh, in Apple stores on tables. So they're, they're going to need to right. also have the, the, the service set up 
for this, which is why a partner would make perfect sense. But I think the issue that Apple is encountering with these negotiations with partners is the partners are concerned about Apple taking their lunch. Because if Apple's EV is better than in terms of at least design and software than the EVs that these partners have on offer, then the partner is just at risk of becoming just this compliant um, manufacturing supplier. And they, they are concerned about this, particularly some manufacturers like um, uh, Mercedes are supposedly very cautious about this, which is why they don't want to offer this next generation CarPlay experience, mm. because they don't want to get the C Apple's experience in people's mind um, at this stage. So yeah, that is one of the, the big open questions is how mm. exactly it will come to market. My bet would be that it will be a very limited production run initially. Um, that would fit a little bit more into Apple's strategy of constraining the supply, um, albeit not intentionally in this case, but to have it as a more desirable item. Um, and that would b develop more enthusiasm for it if, say, unlike a Cybertruck where it just simply isn't available even if you want to get one, the Apple car will be um, so hard to come by, but you, you may see them around. Um, and certainly yeah. it will only be in the U.S., um, uh, which is unusual, um, at least for EVs, which are mostly the platforms for them are developed for a worldwide market. Um, and I wouldn't even be surprised if it was limited to certain states where they got regulatory approval for it initially, just to try and keep the production mm -hmm. run um, as exclusive as possible. Um, I don't think we're going to get, you know, a two weeks to launch on a on a worldwide scale, at least not in right hand uh uh, left left hand drive markets. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, you right yeah. hand drive markets. <laughs> well, yeah. they, they don't have to either. So, you know what I mean? It's totally fine to start with the U.S., which is a giant market. Even if they just started in California, that's still a huge car market, right? I yeah. mean, if you look at the the size of, of of California in a lot of metrics, it's bigger than the U.K. in, in a lot of ways in terms of the number of people, the, the GDP, and all those kind of things. So it's a, it's a it's a big enough market, I think, that it would be a good play and smart for them, specifically around things like service. Like you're saying, if they're trying to figure out parts and all that, because it's a whole new ball game getting into cars. I have no doubt in my mind they would sell every single one that they could possibly make, though. I think it would be a long time before we saw any demand waiver at all, just because of their brand loyalty and the, the brand affinity that people have. You know, I mean, I don't know your guys' thoughts, but I mean, Apple hasn't... Every product they've made hasn't been the best-in-class product of that sure. category, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You know, I mean, Tesla's the same way. You know, I'll throw that back on them too. Like in a lot of ways, their cars are inferior to some of the newer ones coming out, but it doesn't matter because you have such that a strong brand affinity. And this also goes like, how are people buying? Um, Audi electric cars and things. And it's like, well, because people love Audi, you know, same with Mercedes and these other ones. So I think the brand of Apple is so incredibly strong that it wouldn't matter. Uh, whatever their go-to-market strategy is, it'll succeed. Um, the question is scale, because scaling cars is much harder, I would imagine, than scaling smaller devices that require far fewer resources to make, um, you know, and, and then service and those kind of things. But I'm excited for it. I really am. Um, I, I don't have no idea what, what it, you know, when it'll come out of the pricing and all that. But I think I think they could really sort of, you know, change the game in a lot of ways and really give Tesla a run for their money. So you mentioned price, which was what I actually wanted to jump into. Um, the rumored price was like around $120,000, which is a lot of money for a car. Um, you know, Rivians can get up that high, uh, a lot of like what Lucid and some Teslas can get up that high. I mean, maybe if you really can figure it up there, but like over a hundred thousand oh, dollars for a car, I would, I would say for the average consumer, for an average person, uh, over a hundred thousand dollars for yeah. a car is insane. And so, um, you know, one of the things that makes Tesla so uh, appealing is that, you know, when the model three launched, what was that? 2016, um, that that was affordable by all metrics. It was still expensive, and then it dropped, and it's you know that thirty five thousand dollar price market, not really there, but kind of if you look at the savings and however they manipulated that whole price thing. Um, I I have a Model yeah. Three right now. It's like forty eight. That's not bad for a car, but that's still kind of a lot of money for a lot of people who are looking at their car to just get them from point A to point B. So my my main point here is that. You know, now the price is under a hundred thousand dollars. What does that mean? Is that ninety nine? That's still obviously a ton of money. Like, where do you think the price yeah. point would need to be for this to be a mass mass hit? You know, similar to iPhones in in, in the sense, like 
to have that hit product where everyone's trying to adopt one? Uh, seventy nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Okay, because very eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> eighty thousand dollars is the cap for the federal tax credit. Ah. So your car has to be under that. Um, and then I think if uh, if it's a truck or an SUV, it can be more expensive or whatever. So it depends on what it is. If it comes out as a car, like a sedan, versus a crossover, then th- that changes the math on it all. Uh, I would imagine the first ones are going to be, uh, like you said, Harley, like sought after. They're going to be exclusive. They're going to be scarce. And so the price is going to be pretty high. And that's fine. It's not bad at all. I mean, that's the fact that's how Tesla goes to market. This is one of the funny things I see people that are these hardcore Cybertruck fans out there is they're saying, oh, man, I can't wait to get my $40,000 Cybertruck. And I'm going, man. Good luck. <laughs> that's never <laughs> happening. <laughs> that's not how Tesla works. No. Nope. It always starts with the most expensive version and then kind of the mid-tier. And then for a very small window, they sell that promised one, that $35,000 Model 3, the uh, $40,000 Model or $60,000 Model S, uh, you know, whatever it is. It's a small, tiny window. They sell the cheap one. And then a couple months later, they say, you know what? Hey, no one wanted it. Let's go back to the more expensive ones. Uh, so Apple, I think, could follow a similar strategy. The very first ones could be... Uh, I don't know the, what the ter- if there's an Apple term for this, but in Tesla world, we would say founder series cars. You know, they have some sort of special label or special whatever. And yeah, you can price those well over a hundred grand because the people buying them, you know, aren't they don't care, right? You have so many people that are going to want this thing. Uh, then I think they can work backwards into it, right? Like I don't remember, I mean, what the original price of the iPhone was, uh, but even now, I mean, I just bought my wife. Now, granted, I buy the the iPhone with a terabyte in it, so she never runs out of storage and yells good at me. Good move, good move. Uh, so it's like, it, it's like fourteen, fifteen hundred bucks or something. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very expensive product. Now, granted, you can buy. I know they make cheaper versions of the iPhone and stuff. So, I, I think that the price, the the norm, the average price is would I would imagine put it around mid seventies, hopefully. Um, I don't think they're going to go for the cheaper markets. You know, I mean, in fact, if you look at worldwide smartphone sales as sort of a proxy here, uh, last I remember, it was something like 80, 85 percent of worldwide smartphones were Android phones. And the big reason why is that they're so cheap because there's thousands of them and they're a fraction. You can buy one for 200 bucks. And I don't know what the cheapest iPhone is there, but I know it's a lot more than that. So it's one of those things where I think they will they will always probably want to be in that premium price point, which I would. I, the cheapest I could imagine them going is maybe in the, the like mid fifties. Now, granted at that price, you're getting the the tax credit and you know, you said your model three was 48. You're right in line with that. Um, yeah. And also to think about that, when you talk about electric car, you also have to consider the, the real total cost of ownership. I do this a lot on my channel where I look at it and I say, uh, Porsche Taycan, an electric F-150, uh, Tesla model Y compare that to a gas car. And what you end up finding is that you're saving 60 or 70 or even more uh, percent per month on fuel. So that means across five or 10 years, you're going to save sometimes 10, 15, even $20,000 across that time, across the, your ownership period. So when you look at that original price, a lot of people think, how much is my monthly payment going to be? Four or five, 600 bucks, whatever it is. Then you see a Tesla of fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and you're like, dang, this is approaching $800 for my lease or my loan or whatever. But that four or five, six hundred thousand or four or five, six hundred monthly payment on a gas car, you didn't factor in that it's going to cost you two, three hundred dollars in gas. Right. Yeah. And if you go over uh, uh, to, to Europe and the UK and everything, gas is even more expensive over there. So I think when you look at the total cost, they could have a car in the fifty, sixty thousand dollar range and it's going to be like a $35,000 gas car comparison. So I think it's one of those things when, and this is what I really try to focus on my channel is like, let's do the math here and let's look at, look at all the factors, not just that monthly payment, because that's not everything that you really need to consider when it comes to your budget. I'm going to need you to make a video for me specifically talking to my wife when it comes time to, to re up on a car, be like, listen, <laughs> it says it's a thousand dollars a month, but, but it's not that bad. Yeah. Just, just listen to Ben. I'll tell you right now, I, I've had a lot of people stop me on the street and say that exact same thing. Like, you know what? My wife wouldn't do it. And I showed her your video where you broke down the math. And now we have a, you know, Kia EV6 or Tesla Model Y or whatever it is. Yep. So we've talked quite a bit about how 
uh, Apple needs to really challenge Tesla in this space. And that seems increasingly likely given this sub $100,000 price point. It's quite believable to imagine that this vehicle could be a direct competitor to the Model S. And if that is the case, what do you think Tesla will need to do to try and claw back uh, some territory here? Because Apple, as you say, could be a very serious challenger. But I wonder, I, I, I'm skeptical of Tesla really perhaps stepping up their build quality. And Tesla is also not going to be yeah. able to rival the software expertise and software experience of Apple. So where do you think Tesla will go if indeed it is a direct Model S competitor? You know, uh, there have even been talks already about whether or not they should keep selling the S and X um, because it, the, the the numbers are so small and it's so expensive and make it sort of more of a uh, of a niche vehicle. But then the problem with that is they're losing out to Lucid because if you want the most niche electric performance car you can get, it's a Lucid. You know, I guess the Remac Nevera is a different animal for a couple million dollars, but like. You know, looking at it, the Model S future, it, days may be numbered, honestly. It may dwindle down even further. And my bet would be that if the finance team had anything to say, uh, at the finance team at Tesla had anything to say about it, they would say, who cares? Just let it go, man. Like, we make 80% of our money on Model 3 and Model Y. Let's do more of that. You know, if you, if you rewind the clock to when Tesla was had a strong mission that, that they talked about a lot, um, it was to help accelerate the transition to sustainable transportation originally, then energy. But if you think about that, accelerate that transition, the high-end sedan market has already gone electric. Like I said, BMW, Mercedes, Tesla, Lucid, Audi, Porsche, they all have incredible offerings. So the very high-end sedan market is already there. If you're not there, then you're losing. There's just you have nowhere to go, right? If you're uh, if you make high end expensive sedans, there and you're not electric, we're not going electric. Just forget about it. Now, I'm not talking about the economy cars of the world, which will always be around, and things like that, like Toyota and Honda, for example. But even if you look at like Lexus and Cadillac and some of these other ones. So, point being, I don't know if Tesla has uh, a dog in that fight, and they honestly might just say, forget it. You know, we're going to keep iterating on this increasingly niche vehicle, maybe make it a little bit faster, maybe add a little bit more range, but I don't know what else they could do. Like you said, increase the build quality, but they've sort of proven that build quality is not a huge selling factor for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> and, and not to dog on them too much, but I mean, seriously, if you go get in a Model S, a brand new one, and and you drive it around and you feel the bumps and in, in, in the creaks and in, in the noises it makes. And then you go get in a, a brand new EQS, the the electric S class from Mercedes. It is night and day. Now you may not like the look of it, you may not like the interior or whatever, but it is undeniable how much better of a car it is. And that's because Mercedes has been making cars since cars existed, right? So it's one of those things where I don't know if Tesla has a way to come back from that, but I don't know if they care either. They may just say, great. Apple's here. Let's do that. Apple may have a hard time even because they're new. All the other people that love Apple and their brand, uh, th th their fan base will absolutely buy all of them. But in terms of scale and long-term success of a car in that price point, it might be tough because it's a pretty crowded market. Now, if they came out with something else, like say a minivan, which doesn't exist in the electric space, but is still super popular, even if they came into the crossover space, it would be smart because they there's just so much room there you know give me yeah. an electric so it's, minivan it's right now <laughs> yeah well the vw id buzz is like officially yeah. the first electric minivan but yeah. it's not marketed that way you know they're like oh it's fun it's california it's all this and i'm like it's a minivan dude you have sliding doors three rows dude, it's a minivan the first so, the first time yeah. someone actually markets a electric minivan i have no doubt and if it's like relatively affordable you know, keep it in line with the current minivan prices, maybe a little bit more because you're getting that, you know, electric. It, it, they would go, they would be gone. There would, there would be none. You would not, never yeah. be able to find one because there are people like me who has, I have my Tesla, but we also have a minivan <laughs> because we're transporting yep. all these kids around. <laughs> and it's like every day I get into it, I'm like, oh, I wish this was electric in some sort of fashion. Like I'm so sick of going and filling gas. I'm sick of the way it drives. We would we would all be lining yep. up to purchase them. All the men in the world, or even women that were very anti minivan, would want one. Yeah, no, no doubt. So you know, there's a lot of space there to run. 
right? Because it's sort of an untapped market. This is where I sort of applaud Rivian, how they changed their strategy midway through. Uh, I, I, you know, they won't say this, but if you ask me, they basically realized that uh, Tesla owned the sedan space. And so um, we're, let's not try to compete there. Let's go trucks, you know, and now they're, they're dominating, you know, now granted Ford and Chevy are kind of going to conquer that like they've owned it already. But point being, yeah, I think Apple would be smart to find areas and markets that maybe uh, segments that aren't completely saturated. Um, otherwise they will, they, there will be a ceiling of how many per year they can sell. Now, the, the interesting thing in that space would be if Apple somehow is able to take market share from the established automakers, right, from the Mercedes and BMW, if that's where they're targeting, or if you go to the mid-tier like the Acuras, Infinities, Lexus of the world. So that would be interesting if they're able to take that market share away. But um, Tesla, I don't, I don't know that they care about the Model S as maybe as much as, as, much as their marketing might say. Because if you look at the finance side of it, it's not really doing much for them. Let's also real quickly just touch on the like interior, the tech. Um, you know, what's w w this is where I start to like, you know, I, I, all cars for the most part, you can kind of tell between like driving an electric car and going back to uh, a non electric. You can tell the way it feels and whatever. But for the most part, in my world, when I get into a car, it all kind of feels the same. Um, and over time, you know, I just become numb to the way it feels when I drive. But the interior, the tech, the the infotainment, that's where I'm like, okay, this is important to me because this is the stuff that I interact with on a daily basis. Have you, you said you right. just got an iPhone. So have you had a chance to like use CarPlay before in the past? Oh, huge. I'm a huge fan of CarPlay. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. I mean, my, my stance on Apple has always been like they make great products, but the company always annoyed me how they lock you into certain things like the, the home pod only playing Apple music and stuff like that. I just so it angered me so much. I was like, ah, but their products are undeniably great. So I got an iPhone. Uh, this is my first one. And I really do enjoy it. I think it's great. I do miss some of the things on Android that I had, but whatever. The point being, yes, I do use CarPlay when I can. CarPlay doesn't exist, as you know, in Tesla's or Rivian's. Uh, Lucid just added it smartly. Um, and all the classic auto, all the legacy automakers have it already. So when these guys come drop these cars off and I have them for a week, I have a week of car play and it is like a breath of fresh air. It is so nice to not have all these little dumb software issues or have to log into an app or find the podcast that I want to listen to because it's all already there. That's to me the main point that I make anytime ask me about the software in Tesla. I say, it's as good as it gets but it totally sucks compared to CarPlay. So right now, thinking of an Apple car, of, of course it's going to have CarPlay or some other more advanced version of that. Yeah. And see, so, so for most people, it, my argument is that, that your phone is the center of your digital universe, right? It's where you take your photos, you, you, you do social media, you do all your things from here. So something like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto just makes total sense that when you get into your car, it's just an extension of your phone in terms of the tech in there. Apple's car will obviously do that exceptionally well. I would actually question whether or not they'll support Android Auto or something like that. Because no if chance. they don't, that would... <laughs> you know, no, you don't chance. think so? No chance. So this is a question for you, yeah. Yeah. See, so, so that would be a bummer. And I think a lot of those people would be like, well, I'm not buying the Apple car. Maybe they weren't going to buy it anyways. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it won't matter, right? Right. Hartley, you agree with me, right? There's 0% yeah. chance that, that that's going to happen. That's the same thing as if like Android users being like, why can't we have iMessage? It's just not going to happen, at least not right now, if ever. Yeah. Yeah. So Apple's happy to put their services occasionally on other <laughs> devices. So it's like Apple Music coming to Tesla or yeah. it's like, um, I mean, it is even allowing CarPlay in, in, in non-Apple vehicles, obviously, because there is no Apple vehicle at the moment. But the minute it comes to yeah. putting another ecosystem in Apple's walled garden, that is the, that is the big no-no. <laughs> um, so I don't think that is, that is ever going to happen so, uh, because Apple will, yeah. it, Apple will upsell you to it. That, that's the intention. It will be, it, it, Apple will want yeah. to make you feel bad for wanting to use Android Auto. <laughs> so the question I had is, and this is the one I got to ask Elon Musk directly on a call. He basically poo-pooed on the idea at the time, but I think they're coming around to it, is um, would the Apple car have an app store? So if I did have an Android phone, 
I I don't have Apple CarPlay, but I still use Spotify and Pandora and you know Waze or whatever else. Maybe they won't support Waze. Actually, I don't know. But point being, so I can log into the apps and have them feel native. It's not on Bluetoothing everything to my phone like it's a old Nissan Sentra or something. Um, do you think that they would have a built-in app store, or would it basically be like plain vanilla? You just get nothing or Apple CarPlay only. Do you think they would lock it down that hard? Well, I think one way or another, whether it's via an app store or whether it's via CarPlay, you would still get those third-party app experiences because that's effectively the way that CarPlay works right now. If you uh, right. plug your car in or you connect your, uh, your uh, you you plug your phone in or you connect your phone wirelessly to to CarPlay, you still get your third-party podcast app. You still get Waze. Um, you get all of these services. Right. And Apple every year is adding more and more to what developers are able to achieve in CarPlay. So it's already got this framework. It's already got those apps ready. So even if it isn't a full-blown app store, it will want those apps to be available because that, again, gives it a competitive advantage to the experiences that other totally. automakers are able to deliver because it's a, it's a true first-party experience. Right. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Yeah, and, and that is the differentiator, I think, right there. I also feel like some apps will be available. Like, you know, they can't deny Spotify. That's just too popular. They've tried doing that in other products and they've given up um, slowly but surely. Like the HomePod kind of works with Spotify, but still not really. But it's like... Google Maps, maybe? I I, See, that's the thing. I don't know. Because they make, you know, Apple Music and because Apple Maps is a thing, I feel like it's going to really... Like in the car itself. Because in CarPlay, you plug your phone in and it has those apps available and you can use that but like natively it might do one of those things where you need to like it's not going to work you know getting a link sending it to your car i can't imagine it's going to immediately natively open up in google maps unless they you know allow you the option like they did you know now where you can finally set a default mail app in the mac like i don't know Uh, i think it could go either way i wouldn't be surprised i I think these are some of those details though here's Okay, Hartley's got the The, the reason why I think they will is because you can do that now with CarPlay, which means you will be able to do that with mm-hmm. the next generation version of CarPlay that will be in vehicles at the end of this year. So by the time we get to 2026, when this Apple vehicle will be available, there will be hundreds of other vehicles on the market that offer this um, CarPlay experience, including EVs. Um, where those apps will definitely be available because they are available now. So unless Apple is going to strip away functionality that is currently there, which would get them very bad press, um, that would dissuade people from moving over. The whole point of CarPlay is to be uh, a sort of feature that introduces you to the Apple ecosystem so that you don't want to leave. So if they offer an inferior CarPlay experience in the Apple car, then people will think, well, I will just stick with whatever EV I've got now because I can use Google Maps. Because both will be on the market yeah. at the same time. So yeah, I I have a I have a thing. So okay, I I have CarPlay in our minivan, but that's the first time I've ever had a car that's had CarPlay. But it's not my car, like my own personal car. I've never had CarPlay before. Um, and then I've gone from mm-hmm. like a BMW X1 that still didn't have CarPlay to a Tesla. That was like the jump that I had. And in that jump. Like Tesla's operating system for the software, you know, compared to any other car's built in infotainment system. I believe the car I had before the BMW was a Buick or a Ford. Like, those were the cars that I've had beforehand. Like, it feels night and day. There is nothing better than that. But, like, I talk to people right. who have used CarPlay as they're on a regular basis, and they're like, I want CarPlay in my Tesla. And I can't, my brain can't fathom that. Absolutely. Because, because coming from one of those older cars, I'm just like, this is, there's nothing better than this. Like, I've got Spotify, I've got everything I need for the most part. Like, it's touch responsive right. and it's not super laggy. Like, it works well. Like, what could I possibly want? So, you are saying, um, you you want like in your Rivian, they don't have CarPlay. You would you would welcome that. Like, you would use it on a regular basis if it came in. I mean, I berate them online constantly that they don't have it. <laughs> it's beyond just wanting it. Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it is uh, okay. At this point, Tesla, I think their their in car software is good enough to where you can live without CarPlay and it's fine, right? It's okay. passable. I still think it's lame that they don't have it, but at least they are sort of opening up to the idea of having an app store. Uh, for example, if people maybe don't know, but in your Tesla, natively, 
you have Netflix and you have YouTube and you have 20 games you can play natively. So they have sort of an app store, but that Mm -hmm. app store is like bespoke, right? It's not like anybody, any developer out there can just go make an app. It's like Tesla has to work directly with Netflix or Twitch or whomever to create the app for the car. So they seem to be embracing that. And as they roll that out, it will get better and better. I still don't think it's as good as CarPlay because I have to log into these apps it doesn't know me. It's not the the device I already have with all of my preferences and my whole world that I've been, you know, my digital profile, my digital self that I've been building since the internet was created. It's like the phone has all that. It knows me. So it is, CarPlay is still so much better. Plus, it has hundreds of apps that are, it's, I saw like 200 plus apps supported. Maybe there's more, I don't know. But it's like, so anything you can imagine exists and it just works great. So like, Tesla at this point, I get, and I, 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 I could side with them and say how they're saying, look, forget it. We're, we've, we've evolved past it. But Rivian, when I talked to them and I talked to their PR team about this, their excuse for not having CarPlay was they feel they can make better integrated digital experiences than CarPlay offers. And I spit out my coffee because what you're saying is you can make better software than Apple and Google. And I'm sorry, you can make a better truck than Apple and Google for sure today, but software, I'm sorry, guys. No, you can't. It also has uh, the Amazon voice assistant built in. I don't want to trigger people's speakers um, or mine. But it has that <laughs> built in, which is atrocious. It is It is so incredibly bad. Is it really bad? And I, I don't know. Well, you could imagine how it works, right? So you get in, you tri- you use the, the, the trigger word, and then you say navigate home. Well, when I first got my Amazon Echo, it was when it first came out, and my home address was my work address from nine years ago. So it's navigating me there, despite me plugging into the car my actual home address and saving it as home. So, like, it's a very disjointed thing, and I would ask it to play music, and it would start playing on my speaker in my studio. It just didn't know what was going on. It was completely disconnected or, or, or dysfunctional. So... Yeah, it's one of those things when you look at it, you go, guys, I'm sorry, you make an incredible vehicle, but you cannot make better software than Apple and Google. You just can't. You know, uh, Tesla, I would argue, still doesn't make better software, uh, but their software is good enough, I would say, for most people. Most people, like you said, probably get in there, you're just like, oh my God, mind blown, right? Right, But if you live with CarPlay for a while, you realize how lacking it is. Like a, a good example is I like Waze. Wait for me for taking my kids to school. There are three different routes I can take. Depending on traffic, that could be a 20 minute difference in the commute. 20 minutes. That means I'm like either on time to, to drop my kids off at school or I'm now late and my kids are rushing to get in and it's just a nightmare. And then I'm late for a call or something else. So that one difference there, the built in Tesla app, while it does have traffic and it does use some of that, it's definitely not as good as Waze. And so for where I live, anyways, I'll say. So that's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you just need to support it because, and, and you know, for proof of that, just look at the iPhone itself. Imagine if Apple never created an app store, if they only said, we're going to create the apps and that's it. Imagine where we would be like in the world. Like I think Android would, would have probably completely crushed them at, at some point, you know, because you'd go, God, I can't get anything on this damn phone, you know, but they smartly very early on said, look, we can't make all of the software. We can't think of all of the ideas. We don't have the resources, even if we we did. So let's open up an app store. And so I think Tesla's slowly wading into these waters very cautiously. Uh, but CarPlay and, app, and, and, and Android Auto, to, to that same extent, will have already done this. And so it's it would any new car, any new EV maker, in my opinion, must support it. Otherwise, you are really, really swimming upstream trying to compete with everyone else that just does it. Like Kia is a good example. All the Hyundai group itself, every one of their cars has CarPlay and Android Auto natively, wirelessly in in most cases. So you're looking at it going, wow, this little Kia has 200 plus apps that are already on my phone. And this brand new fancy Tesla has six. It's not, you know, not the same thing, not the same experience, not to say it's bad. But I, but this one is definitely more familiar and better in almost every way, in my opinion. So I'm a huge fan. And me, not being a huge Apple fan, <laughs> but having CarPlay, like, this is amazing. So whenever I get these other cars dropped off and I have them for a week, I'm just like, God, it is so nice not having to find my podcast or find that Muse, that Pandora station or whatever. It's like it's just already there. 
So another key dimension to these vehicle software is self-driving functionality or uh, you know, purported self-driving at least. So one thing I'm interested <laughs> yeah. to get your thoughts on, Ben, is where we will be with self-driving from some of these big players like Tesla by 2026 and whether that will be something where Tesla by then can actually offer a meaningful competitive advantage over Apple, which while Apple has vehicles on the road at the moment, they are test vehicles. They are not actually the, the vehicle itself and it will not have the same uh, access to the same amount of data um, that Tesla will by that point, and maybe by then Tesla will be a much more formidable, uh, in, much more formidable in terms of its self-driving capabilities. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think there's there's two ways to think about it. There is the um, this car is going to be a robo taxi that makes me money, which Elon has went on stage and said many many times, um, and then there's this is just a better driving experience for me as the driver. And so that would be, I would fall into the kind of safety side of the equation, right? Is my car safe and does it offer me safety features, which we kind of categorize or Tesla has correctly or incorrectly labeled as self-driving. Um, so those are kind of two separate things, robo-taxi versus just a safer, better driving experience. I think by 2026, robo-taxis are still 10 to 15 years away, a true robo-taxi. And then... Honestly, the economics of it don't even make sense uh, in terms of an actual, like, I'm just going to click a button, my car goes out there, whatever. It's I don't think it's going to deliver on that promise. It's kind of like that Dunning-Kruger thing where it's like, oh, yeah, everyone's super hyped on it. And then as you get into the details, your confidence just drops all the way to the bottom. So robo-taxis, let's just exclude that from this part of the conversation and talk about uh, advanced driver assist systems, ADOS systems, as you'll see them called. Um, Tesla currently is level two. And their functionality, the uh, autopilot and enhanced autopilot, I think are best in the industry. They are incredibly good at what they do. The full self-driving side of it, which is where Tesla's trying to go with, I assume, I mean, if you believe their marketing, they're talking level five autonomy, which is complete, like you don't have a steering wheel. Like you, you often say level four or five, meaning you never need to have a human intervene ever. Level two is where we're at now, where it'll speed up and slow down, keep you in your lane, and then maybe do some lane changing or some light other maneuvers, but that's about it. You still have to have your hands on the wheel, still have to be paying attention, that kind of a thing. That's where we're at now. In 2026, you said, I think we'll still be in that same place. The, the confidence in those maneuvers and those things will probably be better, but we won't, I don't think, be at true level three yet. Level three is where the driver rarely has to intervene. And this is the real, really dangerous area where already at level two, people just put it in autopilot and just hop on their phone, texting, watching a video, whatever, not paying attention at all. Bad news, right? That's not good. And then level three is where that is actually should be okay. You should just occasionally have to pay attention and, and take control. That's the real danger zone because this is where people are going to you know, figuratively fall asleep at the wheel and you're going to overtrust it and it's going to lead to some bad results uh, from time to time. The, you know, just think about airplanes and, and the progression, right? You don't even think about the safety of a, of a flight now, but 50, 60 years ago, different animal, right? It wasn't uncommon to hear about a crash. And so it was definitely in your mind. So I think we're still, you know, 20, 30 years away from the idea of a truly autonomous vehicle that you hop in and the fact of it crashing is like unheard of. That'd be major worldwide news. So 2026, uh, if if Apple could deliver on essentially where Tesla's at today uh, with their autopilot, the basic autopilot functionality, I think that would be enough for almost everybody. Um, if you look at the, the polls on people's trust in self-driving cars, it's still extremely low. And so there's, you know, social kind of hurdles that people have to get over, psychological hurdles that companies have to get over before the technology can even be adopted. So self-driving is one of those things where the hype is, you know, at a maximum and it has been for a long time, but the reality is not even close to that. And the road in between is going to be a long one. Um, the one thing I like to say, though, is it doesn't mean that this pursuit is not worthy like we should pursue this because there are great benefits and things that we, we, we will eventually realize. And the road between here and there 
can bear a lot of fruit. Even if you think about um, automatic emergency braking, which I believe Volvo came out with in like 2009 or something like that, that alone right there has saved a lot of lives. And so even though that's not full self-driving, it is a feature that you need for full self-driving that does help people and does make the road safer. So I think it's a worthy pursuit. I think we will get there eventually, but it's on a much longer time horizon than any one online is going to tell you, <laughs> really. Um, and, and you know, between now and 2026, that's really, I don't think it'll be much different than the world we live in today in terms of what's possible. I completely agree with you. Um, there's just no way I can see that ever happening in the next three to four years. There's just no way. And I can explain to you why is because when I'm in my car and I have autopilot on, and all of a sudden, at 75 miles an hour, I come to a screeching halt on the freeway because my car accidentally feels like something's in front of me, which nothing was in front of me. That's the stuff that I have a hard time like wanting to ever move yep. away from, you know? And until you can regain trust for many, many years, like you said, you know, like an airplane crashing is major world news because it just so rarely happens. Um, but, you know, we've I've seen videos, I, I think a lot of people have seen that video of that Tesla just having a mind of its own and flying through at a hundred miles an hour because the car just took off. And like, you know, I don't know whether the details of that were like that was user error and somebody just explained what, even if that was software and the car just took off and did its own thing and crashed. And so, I, I'm not interested in that at all. Like I barely yeah. use autopilot because of my own, you know, terrifying experience. And I know a lot of people have had, have you had any crazy autopilot experiences where you're like, okay, that's enough for me today. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, my wife won't let me use it at all if the family's in the car. Um, a, a good example is my wife just went out to, I'm in San Diego. She's in Phoenix. It's a straight 400 mile drive across the desert as flat basically as you could imagine it straight drive. Uh, she told me last time she was on autopilot on the way back 11 times it slammed on the brakes. And we're talking, there's nothing. It's not like there's an overpass or a shadow on the road. Literally, just straight desert, like almost like in a movie, you would imagine. Just a straight flat road across the desert. And it just, so that right there erodes your trust. Now, yeah. now the, the interesting thing is, I think a lot of people that talk about this online, that, that talk about, oh my God, it's going to change the world. Look at how great it is, blah, blah, blah. They don't own these cars. They don't live with them. They don't have these experiences. So it's almost like some getting parenting advice from somebody that doesn't have kids. It's like, okay, guys, whatever. <laughs> like until you've been there and know what it's like, yeah. you can't really your 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 opinion. You don't have a fully formed opinion on it. Um, and yeah, you're you're totally right. It's uh, I've had a lot of scary experiences. I've also done a lot of testing with it. Um, Tesla's even given me uh, early access to certain features before to do you know like a video on so I can launch it when the embargo lifts and that kind of a thing, and and in those experiences I've had to call them and say guys I don't know because this isn't working right you know um, I, I I fear that they have oversold it and it is a much longer time horizon and so you know a lot of people I think that, that as as you get the car and as you live with it. You, you really start to realize how far off it is. Now, it is amazing at what it can do. It's not to discredit what they are able to do, but to assume that it is anywhere near ready is just naive at this point, I would say. So, yeah, I've had a lot of scary experiences. I mean, in my Rivian, it doesn't have it. It has a basic form of autopilot, and they've... But this is like one good thing they've said is they basically said, we're going to let someone else figure that out. And then once it's like totally safe and good, we're going to try to adopt that. But right now we're Rivian stance is, hey, we're the adventure vehicle company. We want you to drive because we want you to be off road. We don't want you to be, you know, just just be your commuter. We want you to go see the world and explore and all that. So I applaud their approach being much more reasonable and humble about it. Tesla's, I think, is where they get themselves into into some trouble. In fact, I mean, there's class action lawsuits. I know one in Germany, which was funny because they were selling people full self-driving level five autonomy in Germany and they got sued for it and they lost because the court said, well, that's actually illegal. So, you know, <laughs> you're selling yeah. something, something that is technically illegal <laughs> by our current laws. So, uh, <laughs> no, you know. Um, I, but yeah, it's a, it's going to be a much slower progression than I think anyone on Twitter wants to believe. 
Hartley, do you have anything else? We're very pressed up against time, but it's been great. Just a lot of conversation. I completely lost track of time, honestly. Um, I have a, just like three or four random, very rapid fire questions that I have for Ben, but that's about it. But if you have anything you want to touch on, Hartley, um, let me know now. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, just real quick, and you don't have to go into any crazy responses if you don't want to. Um, what is, in your opinion, the best EV on the market right now? And take into mind price, um, you know, build quality, software and hardware features, et cetera, and driving, obviously. Like, what do you think, just without thinking too hard, is the best one that you've driven so far? Uh I think the one most people would be happy with is the Kia EV6 or the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which are basically the same car with different uh, styling. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you think, so my, I guess this is kind of a follow-up question. Do you think uh, those cars could surpass, let's just say Apple doesn't come to anything in the next you know, five to 10 years. Do you think those cars in this current trajectory with everything else in the market could pass up Tesla's popularity? That'd be tough. Um, they are incredibly good vehicles and they have good brand loyalty. People know them. Tesla has been for a while, I believe, eroding a lot of consumer confidence in them with how they treat certain issues. Um, and you know, the quality issues, like you're talking about autopilot, phantom braking, that's called, uh, you know, so if that continues to proliferate and people's trust and confidence in Tesla continues to to wane, then I don't know that Kia or Hyundai will do it individually, but they Tesla may lose a tremendous amount of market share overall to let's say the Mustang Mach E, which is in the same category, the Nissan Aria, which is an incredible vehicle, especially at a good price point. I mean, there's a lot of vehicles in this space. So um the 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 overall market share could be very mixed as these other cars really really come to market in kind of full force. You know, imagine like when the iPhone first came out and they just dominated, and then now you know they own a small smaller percentage of the worldwide market, but a, a monster share of the profits, right? So you look at that and you go, well, okay, when Android came out, yeah, there was like one phone and it sucked. So <laughs> you know, but as that proliferated, over, they eventually overtook Apple in terms of worldwide sales. So I could see a similar thing happening where Tesla is more of a niche product. Um, and, and not to go, I don't want to go too, too much on a tangent, but I had a conversation with MKBHD about this and we were tossing around this idea of, of Tesla becoming more of like Google, Google when it comes to phones where they do make phones, but they're pretty niche, right? They're mm -hmm. more known for Android, for making Android. And so, you know, Tesla could kind of be the same where they, they have four, five models that they make of cars and they sell, but more so, they provide batteries and powertrains and software to everyone else. I thought that and would have been a smarter move charging. for them. Kind of become, yeah, yeah. Like they have some very distinct advantages that if they wanted to truly scale and grow, they could do so much more rapidly. Let the like making cars to the people that have been doing it forever, and just do the stuff that they're really good at, and you know really dominate the market. So whether or not they are selling the individual car, it doesn't matter because they're still selling the the kind of the guts of it. So I thought that would be an interesting idea, but I don't know that Kia or Hyundai could individually overtake Tesla, but maybe Tesla will not become the, the majority of EVs eventually to everyone else. And that was kind of the last thing that I wanted. We didn't even touch on this. And so real quickly, what do sure. what does Apple need to do? And this also kind of just extends to anyone else. Um, is Apple going to need to try to make their own proprietary charging or do you think they're going to work off of Electrify America? Or I think Tesla just needs to bite the bullet and work with everyone like they are doing now, but like really ramp that up yeah. to where there are more superchargers, there's more available, and every single there just needs to be one standard charging thing. Um, so, do you think yeah. that's the route that they would go, or do you think Apple will try to do the Apple thing and make its own proprietary <laughs> nonsense? <laughs> Th that would be hilarious, like a lightning cable just for your car. Or yeah, and you gotta pl you gotta plug it into the bottom <laughs> like of it. You gotta plug it into the bottom, <laughs> yeah. like the like yeah, the like, mouse. You have to have a, a lift. Yeah. Oh god, that'd be hilarious. Uh, no, no, uh, absolutely not. That that would be. I, I would go down there and yell at them personally if they did anything stupid like that. Um, <laughs> but no, what they need to do in the U.S. anyways is adopt CCS. Um, I think it's CCS2, and then in, in Europe you have CCS1. Anyways, uh, it's a standard charging um, 
uh, uh, interface. And Tesla, I don't know if that's what you're alluding to, but Tesla has now started opening superchargers to Mm -hmm. non-Teslas via an adapter that they install themselves and all that. So I think Tesla is going to continue to do that. Um, And and that's going to hopefully that will be a fast adoption. I cynically think that they're only doing that to get that government money, uh, whatever the incentives are for. And maybe there's like, hey, if you have X percent of your network available, that's enough. Here, take all the money. And they may just say, cool, we're going to do the minimum and take all the money and be done. I hope that's not really what their intent is. But if Tesla opens up the, the network to everyone, Apple Car has to be CCS because that's just this. It's literally every it's like Tesla has their own. Every other car in the U.S. has CCS with the exception of the old Nissan Leaf or the mm-hmm. current Nissan Leaf as well. And that's just because the Nissan Leaf was like the first electric car, the first mass market electric car. And they had a standard that was popular in Japan and didn't exist out here. So they just went with what they had, right? So yeah, totally. CCS has to be, uh, you, they'll use every single network out there, all the fast charging networks, um, and then Tesla's network as it grows. Maybe by 2026, a good percentage of the supercharging network will be available. And if so, man, what what a game changer that is for everyone else. Because charging a non-Tesla does suck. Um, but I think the, the misunderstanding by a lot of people is that you have to go to a charger to charge it at all. Where... 90% of the time you're just charging at home. Yeah. The only time that doesn't happen is if you don't have a place to charge at home or at work, which isn't a insignificant percentage of the population. You know, I like imagine like I have a lot of friends in New York. They just they don't have a garage. Are you kidding me? They just park on the street. So yeah, for so for a lot of people, millions and millions of people in this country, the, you do not have a place to charge at home or at work. So that sucks. And that's where the charging really needs to come up. But for a lot of people, that have a home or an apartment or work with a charger, you never even think about a fast charging network unless you're on a road trip, you know, once or twice a year on average. So it's one of those things where I think it's overblown in the media. Like you have to have as many ga- uh, as many fast chargers as you do gas stations. Just not really the case. You know what I mean? Because most people can charge at home. And, and my last final question, a personal question, but maybe this will apply to anyone else out there who's listening. Um, I, my lease is up next year with my model three. I would like something that can fit all three kids. Uh, preferably Mm. I don't want to be in a Tesla anymore, but I'm also nervous about charging. And now you're right. I 99.9% of the time charge at home, but that's because I have very low mileage in my car in terms of how much range I can get. And I also don't travel anywhere with this car that much besides my own personal stuff because I can't really fit all three kids comfortably. Um, So in theory, if I did have a car that could fit them in there comfortably, I would like to take it on road trips uh, and drive around more. So keep in mind range and size and affordability. What would you, would you recommend just biting the bullet and get a Model Y? Or if not, what car do you recommend? Uh, how, how old are the kids? What's the age ranges? So right now they're six, four, and about one and a half. Going to be two here at the end of the year. Okay, so they're all in car seats still. Yes. Um, which is so that that adds yeah. So the Model Y, I would say, not even a good candidate. Anyways, uh, I have two kids in the Model Y, and that's enough. Uh, I don't even know if you could fit a third one, maybe on one of these like inflatable jump seats or something. Well, we, um, we transitioned we transitioned so, our oldest into like a normal booster. Um, where it's a very like yeah. it's it that's kind of low profile, very small, and then our daughter would be in one of those like high back boosters, but she'd still need the harness. So really, mm-hmm. my my youngest is the one who yeah. needs the giant thing, still flipped around the other way and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I would say look at considering that um, it, it, if you did want to stay in the Tesla space, you'd have to go Model X is the only thing I would recommend. Uh, which is much more expensive vehicle and all that. It's really cool, but has its own kind of quirks and stuff. Um, I would probably, hopefully, uh, probably not by the time your lease is up, but the Kia EV9 is coming out, and that's a three-row full-size SUV. Uh, it's Kia. It'll be relatively affordable. It'll be really well-built. It'll have CarPlay. It'll be it'll be great in, 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 in a lot of ways. Uh, the, uh, on the higher end, the next level up, I would go the Volvo EX90, but I think that's still maybe two years out. Um, like they invited me to the launch of it and I said, no, just bring it to my house. They said, we'll have it for you the end of next year for oh a press loaner, which oh we, boy. yeah. So I'm like, eh, 
But that thing's, I mean, it's a Volvo. So again, if you know Volvo, very nice vehicles, very well built, you know, good design, all that stuff, high quality. So that will be a great three-row SUV. Um, but if I had to get one today, so Kia EV9 and Volvo EX90 Future, today, the only one I could think of that would even be worthy is the Rivian R1S. Um, problem is, it's a hundred grand, you know? Yeah, that, that's the thing. So like in my mind, so the, the, the real brief follow-up question is, do I next year bite the yeah. bullet and go back to a, a, a gas car uh, until more things come out in the market that are affordable? Mm-hmm. Well, you have the minivan still. Are you getting rid of the minivan or? No, no, no. My car is just the Model 3. So that would be, we would, it would just be that yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Uh, yeah, because like I said, in, in the in the electric space right now, three-row SUV full that that can fit the kids. Because you can buy the Model Y with the jump seat, but it it is not really, I mean, it's tight back there. It can work, but it's more like in a pinch. I wouldn't want that to be your everyday driver. Model X is the only option, but then you're going to be buying used unless you want to spend 150 grand. You know, and at that point, if you are spending a hundred grand plus, I'm going to go Rivian R1S. It is so much better in terms of that kind of functionality. So um, it's tough right now. Yeah. So maybe a gas car or maybe a plug-in hybrid, like a uh, Kia Sorento plug-in hybrid, or there's a few in that space that are still kind of like full-size SUVs, but get 40 plus miles to the gallon when you add it all up and, you know, something like 40 miles on pure electric. So plug-in hybrid w- might might be a good option to fill that gap between now and Kia EV9 and Volvo EX90. Although the Volvo EX90 is going to be expensive vehicle as well. So Kia EV, Kia EV9 is probably the only one um, that should be really on your mind as far as all those constraints. This conversation is making me sad. because I'm going to have some very, <laughs> very bad decisions to make next year. Um, man, thank you so much. Yeah. This was been this has been great. So much information. Um, do you want to plug anything that you have coming up? Your Just channel. Fo- Find me on YouTube. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Just look for my name. Yeah, just Google search Ben Sullins or YouTube search Ben Sullins. We'll have it all linked in the description so everybody can check it out. Um, And Ben, thank you so much for coming on, man. Absolutely. Pleasure, guys.